Yamato, arguably one of, if not the most famous ship of World War II, certainly the most famous ship in the Imperial Japanese Navy. This Leviathan would be the largest battleship built, with a full load displacement of around 72,000 tons, and with a main battery of nine 18.1-inch guns. She certainly had the potential to be a decisive factor in a duel with other battleships, but due to developments and changes in warfare, when she was sunk, the seas were no longer dominated by large battleships like herself, but by aircraft carriers and the planes they carried. However, that is a long time off from when our story begins, the age of battleships in the Battle of Tsushima. Following the Japanese fleet's decisive victory against the Russian Navy, it proved something that Imperial Japanese strategists had believed even before the war. That the defense of Japan could be achieved through a decisive battle like Tsushima, and because of that, the Navy would need large capital ships in order to achieve the defense of Japan and her Imperial ambitions. Following the Russo-Japanese War, Japan would look to the most powerful remaining Imperial powers in Asia, the United Kingdom and the United States. In this, Japanese military theorists believed that war would break out with at least one of her rivals in Asia, and therefore had to possess a navy to contest the other powers. Comparatively, Japan was not as economically developed as the other powers, and therefore could not afford to match the others ship for ship. But Japanese Admiral Tetsutaro would advocate for the Japanese navy to maintain a fleet that possessed at least 70% the capital ship strength of the United States Navy which they believe such a navy could defeat the U.S. Navy in a major battle in Japanese waters if such a conflict was to break out. Following the development of HMS Dreadnought and the battlecruiser Invincible, it would set back Japanese plans to keep up with other powers, leading to the 1907-88 plan, which envisaged a fleet of eight modern battleships and eight modern battlecruisers in service at one time. With this, the Japanese would order the first dreadnoughts Koachi and Setsu, being ordered in 1907, but with economic constraints, the 8-8 plan wasn't exactly feasible, eventually being cut down considerably. In 1913, Japanese plans would change again, and a quote from Yamato, flagship of the Japanese Imperial Navy by Daniel Knowles, Japanese naval tactics centered around its battle lines with early tactics favoring forming the battle line into a line ahead formation, whereby the fleet could cross the T of the enemy. The desired number of battleships was 16, as this was considered to be the maximum number of ships that could be controlled by a single commander and would be broken down into two Senta divisions, each of which consisted of eight ships. A major component of this Japanese tactic would be the need to outrange enemy ships, so they could strike before the enemy could return fire effectively. This would be brought to fruition through the main battery of battleships and battlecruisers, being first put into practice with the 14-inch guns found on the battlecruisers of the Congo class. This concept of outranging the enemy would continue through the 16-inch armed Nagato class and eventually to the 18.1-inch guns found on the Yamato class. Following coordinated efforts with British designers, the Japanese would have access to the latest British design studies and then be able to design their own capital ships. In order to outmatch the US New York class, they would build the Fuso and Yamashiro with a 23-knot top speed and 12 14-inch guns. Again, quoting here from Yamato, flagship of the Japanese Imperial Navy, this design was superior to its American counterparts in speed, armament, and armor. It also kept in line with the doctrine that the Japanese had used since the First Sino-Japanese War, 1894-95, of compensating quantitative inferiority with qualitative superiority. Following this, there would be the Issei and Nagato classes, and then they planned a further six 16-inch armed battleships of the Kaga and Ki classes. Through the First World War and following it, other nations would develop new capital ships like the United States with the six South Dakota-class battleships and the six Lexington-class battlecruisers. Not to mention the British with their planned Admiral-class, G3, and N3 classes that would hopefully keep their global dominance. The Japanese would have more plans for more battleships and battlecruisers, like the 16-inch armed Amagi-class. There would be common factors between all these ships. They were heavily armed and heavily armored, meaning that they would cost quite a substantial amount of money. To generalize a bit for the sake of time, with the cost, political debates in nations, and the desire to avoid future wars and a naval arms race, diplomats from the major naval powers of Japan, Great Britain and their empire, Italy, France, and the United States would meet in Washington, D.C. in November of 1921. What is important to our story was the decision of the 5-5-3 ratio, in which the Japanese would have a fleet 60% of the size of the American and British fleets, as well as the scrapping of a large portion of capital ships, including older vessels and some of the ones being constructed but naval powers would be allowed to keep some of their ships. The Japanese were allowed to retain Mutsu, meaning that they would have two 16-inch armed ships, while the Americans would retain three ships of the Colorado class, and the British would be allowed to build two new 16-inch armed ships, displacing 35,000 tons, seeing as how they would be allowed to keep the very large HMS Hood. 
These powers would be allowed to retain hulls to be converted into aircraft carriers, with the Japanese choosing the battleship Kaga and the battlecruiser Akagi. The Washington Naval Treaty would be concluded on the 6th of February 1922, and the terms of the treaty pertaining to battleships is as follows. The construction of new battleships was prohibited for a period of 10 years. The ships had to be 20 years old before being replaced. Battleship tonnage was limited to a maximum of 35,000 tons. The main armament of battleships was to be limited to no greater than 16 inches. With that, the Japanese would send four battleships to the breakers, leaving them with 10 while the Americans and British had 18 each. There would be subsequent treaties of which Japan would sign up until the Second Disarmament Conference in London. And as of January of 1937, for all intents and purposes, Japan was free from the treaty system. It also coincided with the Japanese government becoming more nationalistic and militarist, to which these nationalists call for the expansion of the Japanese Empire to include much of the Pacific and Asia. With all the capital ships at its disposal being constructed before 1921, with the exception of the upcoming Yamato and Musashi, though with all being modernized or reconstructed in the 1930s, Japan would still require a sizable fleet to protect these vast holdings they hoped to gain. With gun range still being a core component of naval doctrine, during the mid-1930s a great deal of development was put into greater gun elevation and specially designed shells. Believing that they could outrange the battleships of the United States by between 4,324 and 5,468 yards. With this, they hoped that they could cripple their targets before they had an opportunity to retaliate. In the interwar period, there would be two schools of thought debated, whether the navy should be organized around the battleships or whether it should be organized around the aircraft carriers. Neither would really prevail, and I think it's a good time to shoehorn in a topic that is pretty important to the development of battleships, their doctrine. I will be taking from the Imperial Japanese Navy in the Pacific War by Mark Still. He writes, Japanese tactics centered around the battle line. Early Japanese tactics favored forming the battle line into a line ahead formation. The Japanese formation would maneuver to cross the enemy's T and deal devastating blows by concentrating fire on selected targets. Japanese destroyers would launch night torpedo attacks on the enemy battle line, should a decisive result not be reached after the first day. The battle line was too valuable to risk at night, with the exception of the fast battleships, which were tasked to support the breakthrough of lighter units delivering torpedo attacks. The battle line would maneuver into position to engage the weakened enemy at dawn and finish them off. There would be revisions to this battle doctrine, and in 1934, the revised battle instructions would be developed, stating that the battleship divisions are the main weapon in the fleet, and that their task is to engage the main force of the enemy. Again quoting here, Other elements of the fleet, including carrier aircraft, submarines, cruisers, and destroyers, would conduct torpedo attacks to cripple the enemy, but it was up to the battleships to deliver the decisive blows. End quote. Obviously, there's a lot more details when it comes to doctrine, but I hope that this gave you guys a general idea of what Japanese battleships were hoped to do, especially the Yamato. Like I previously mentioned, the Japanese government was turning even more ultra-nationalistic, and that too coincided with the revised battle instructions that were issued to the general staff. With this turn in government, it worried members of the United States Congress, eventually causing the United States Navy to grow in size as to counter the threat of the Japanese. The Japanese could not compete with the United States industrially, so they decided to develop new battleships individually superior to their counterparts in the United States, or more easily said, quality over quantity. With that, each of the new battleships should be able to engage multiple of the enemy battleships at once, which would eliminate the need to devote as much of Japan's industrial strength to competing with the United States in battleship construction. Theoretically, of course. To take once more from Yamato, flagship of the Japanese Imperial Navy, quote, so it was decided that the design of the Yamato-class battleships was shaped by the expansionist movements within the ranks of the Japanese government, Japanese industrial power, as well as the need for a fleet that was powerful enough to intimidate any likely adversaries, end quote. With that lead-up, we will move into the actual development and design of the Yamato-class. Preliminary studies would begin following Japan's departure from the League of Nations and the various naval treaties. Now, it would start when the Bureau of Naval Construction was directed by the Naval General Staff, to begin design work on a new class of super battleships, the first of which would be completed in March of 1935, and followed by 22 further designs, with main batteries varying between 16-inch and 18.1-inch guns, while secondaries were composed of 6-inch, 5-inch, and 1-inch guns. Propulsion in these designs were planned to be a new hybrid diesel turbine combination, with endurances varying. The Naval General Staff would challenge the designers to create a design with armor capable of withstanding fire from 18-inch guns, to this end, they would determine that such a ship would require a displacement of at least 69,000 tons. 
After these designs had been reviewed, two would be used as finalists, the first being A140F3 and the second A140F4, with the largest difference being their cruising range, with there being a 2300 nautical mile difference between the two. The two designs would continue to be tweaked and changed through March of 1937, of which the finalized design would be a battleship that would display 70,000 tons and have a range of 7,200 nautical miles. The new vessels would be powered by turbine engines as the hybrid diesel turbine propulsion system wasn't quite ready yet. As for in the main armament, the ships would carry nine 18.1-inch guns and three triple turrets, being a strategic decision as, like I mentioned, Japan could not hope to match the industrial power of the United States, so the best option the Japanese saw was to make each individual ship as powerful as possible, so that hopefully the Americans could not catch up within a few years. The design was quickly accepted by the Japanese High Command, over the objections of the advocates for naval aviation, who wanted to build aircraft carriers instead of these large battleships. For this video, we will be looking at the Yamato for the specifics. In another video, we might take a look at the Musashi, or the conversion of the Shinano, and discuss the other ships that were planned but not complete. The Yamato would be built by the Kure Naval Arsenal and laid down on November 4th, 1937, with a standard displacement of 62,315 tons, and a 71,659 ton full load. Now, my sources do vary in displacements given, so if anyone has any definitive displacement, please put it down in the comments. As for the armaments, around 27 guns were built for the three ships of the Yamato class. The construction of the barrels would be a rather complicated process, and taking from the Yamato flagship of the Japanese Imperial Navy. In the first instance, a tube was built before being pressure welded in three stages. A half-length tube was fitted over the first tube and then shrunk onto it. The assembly was then wire round, and two more additional tubes were shrunk over the entire length of the gun tubes. A final inner tube was then inserted down the gun and expanded into place. This inner tube was subsequently rifled in order to finish the gun. This would mean that it would be more cost-effective to replace the entire barrel rather than reboring it. The barrels would have a length of 69 feet 4 inches. The turrets of these guns could traverse around 300 degrees and could be elevated to 45 degrees and depressed to negative 5 degrees. The guns would have a range of 26.1 miles with a truly effective range of 16 miles. Each of these guns could fire an assortment of shells including a 3,219 pound armor piercing shell and a 2,998 pound high explosive shell. Along with that main battery of 9 18.1-inch guns, the original design would call for a secondary armament of 12 6.1-inch dual-purpose guns, being mounted in four triple turrets. In addition, the Yamato would carry 12 5-inch guns and six twin turrets. In 1944, the two midship 6.1-inch turrets were removed and replaced by more 5-inch mounts. It should be noted that these guns were dual-purpose. The dedicated anti-aircraft armament would originally consist of 24 25mm anti-aircraft guns, Deciding to replace the earlier 40mm Vickers pom-pom guns with the designs based on the 25mm Hotchkiss design, making a number of minor alterations including replacing the simple conical flash suppressor with a Rheinmetall type design. There would be several different models with a triple, double, and single being in service in 1943. In the ship's final configuration, the Yamato would be armed with 162 25mm anti-aircraft guns, as well as two twin 13.2mm Type 93 anti-aircraft machine guns as originally fit. The Yamato would have belt armor up to 16.1 inches, with the transverse bulkheads of the armor citadel being up to 14 inches thick. The armor of the main battery turrets face would have armor 26 inches thick, 10 inches on the sides, 9.5 inches on the rear, and 11 inches on the roof. The main armor deck was between 7.9 inches and 9.1 inches. The front bar bets would be covered by a 21.5 inch armor plate, with the sides covered by 16 inch armor plates. The conning tower would have a maximum thickness of 19.7 inches, there would also be torpedo bulkheads extending 9 and a quarter feet from the main belt, from the waterline to the bottom of the ship. Taking from the Imperial Japanese Navy in the Pacific War once more, the propulsion system included four Kampon geared turbines with steam provided by 12 Kampon boilers. This provided a total of 150,000 shaft horsepower to four propeller shafts, which met the design speed of 27 and a half knots. Yamato was reported to have made an excess of 28 knots in June of 1942. Maneuverability was excellent. A small healing angle, even at high degrees of rudder at high speed, maintained a good platform for gunnery. The Yamato class would not have a traditional pagoda design for their mass being improved and streamlined. The tower would consist of two concentric cylinders with a rangefinder top. The tower would be the nerve center of the ship. Precautions were taken to protect the area from strafing runs from enemy aircraft, with the inner cylinder being one and a half meters in diameter. 
If the spaces in between the two cylinders being used for various purposes like passages or staff briefing rooms. When we take a look at the Musashi, we will look more in depth at the various rangefinders and other equipment found on the ships. Finally, the Yamato would be laid down in November of 1937, launched in August of 1940, and commissioned in December of 1941. The intention of this video was to discuss the development of the Yamato if you all wanted me to make a series or even a single video on the ship's service history. I think I'm going to try to get back into making more one-off videos, just so things are more coherent and easier to follow for everyone, especially myself. I hope you all have enjoyed our first look into the Imperial Japanese Navy, and until next time my friends, good luck and have a good week.